Testing, yeah. testing one, two. Uh, before we begin, i just like to ask everyone to just turn off your cell phones and beepers and the like. Uh, we are recording live for Facebook. So um, when we do come around for the Q&A, uh, please wait for the microphone, okay? All right, we'll be starting momentarily. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Mechanics Institute. My name is Ralph Lewin, and I'm the director here. And you know, at the core of the dream of Mechanics Institute is the hope that through education and conversation that we can create a better society. And we established that dream about 160 years ago here at Mechanics. And what amazes me is uh, the founders, they created this place when the gold rush had busted and there was something like 70% unemployment. And so they wanted to think of a way to get out of it. And the way they decided to get out of that situation was to create a library. So I love that radical notion, the idea that through self-improvement, through education, that we can create a better society. And they asked that kind of age-old question, what kind of society do we want to be? And uh, in many ways, tonight, we're asking that same question except through transportation. What kind of society do we want to be in transportation? So if you love that question, what kind of society do you want to be, you're probably a perfect fit for the Mechanics Institute. And I want to encourage you all to become members if you're not already. If you are a member, to tell your friends to become members because that's how we've survived for 160 years. Um, I also wanted to say that this membership is probably one of the coolest gifts you could ever give a friend. <laughs> so think about that. You'll be giving them a gift not only to be part of the library, our 160,000 books that we have downstairs, to have a shared workspace, and also to be part of the largest social club for introverts in the world. <laughs> So with that, let me hand it over to Laura Shepard, and she'll introduce the panel. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Ralph. So good evening, and welcome to the Mechanics Institute at 57 Post Street. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our program, Transforming SF, the Future of Transportation. This program is moderated by Walter Thompson of Hoodline, with panelists Senator Scott Weiner, Evan Golden of Chariot, Joe Fitzgerald Rodriguez of the San Francisco Examiner, and Charles Rathbone, Medallion Holders Association. This new series, Transforming SF, explores the Bay Area's evolving culture and what trends and movements will influence how we live in California, the nation, and the world. Upcoming events also include the future of privacy and security on April 27th and the future of the city co-sponsored with AIA San Francisco on June 29th. So please see our website for details and pick up our calendar, which is right at the doorway. Once again, for those of you who are new, we encourage you to come on Wednesday for the free tour of the Mechanics Institute Library and you'll also find out more about our history, as Ralph has mentioned, and find out more about what we have to offer. So we have our 
general interest library on the second and third floors, an international chess club down the hallway. Our programs include author events, a series like this, cinema lit film series on Friday night, author programs, uh, book clubs, writers groups, computer classes, and of course the chess tournaments and classes that are, are going on throughout the week. So we hope that you'll join us, become a member, and uh, take the tour. Also, after the program, we would like to welcome you to come down to the Dada Bar, which is in our retail space on the first floor, and members receive a 10% discount on drinks. It's just a perk. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Walter Thompson. Walter is a journalist who's worked in the, with tech startups for two decades. He's the community editor for Hoodline, a hyperlocal news service. His work has appeared in San Francisco Magazine, and he is also working on Golden City, a documentary about technology, how technology has tr transformed housing and transportation in San Francisco. So please, a warm wel welcome to Walter and our panel. Thanks everyone for being here. Can you all hear me? I guess is my first question. Great, excellent, all right. So I'll get right into it, introduce our fantastic panel. Sitting next to me is Evan Golden. He's director of product at Chariot, a service now used by thousands of commuters and dozens of companies around the San Francisco Bay Area in Austin, Texas. Chariot was recently acquired by Ford Smart Mobility and will expand nationwide this year to eight markets total. Uh, before Chariot, he was the first product manager at Lyft ride-hailing service, helping scale Lyft service to hundreds of cities nationwide and creating Lyft for Work, a platform that makes it possible for companies to use Lyft for business travel and commuting. He's also born and raised on the peninsula. Next to Evan is Senator Scott Weiner, representing District 11 in the, in the state Senate. Uh, he was previously a member of the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, where he was a champion for creating housing policy to make housing more affordable, improving the reliability and capacity of public, of public transportation, ensuring neighborhood safety, fighting against the impacts of climate change and the drought, and safeguarding and expanding the rights of all communities, including the LGBT community. Wiener has lived in the Castro for nearly 20 years. Next to Senator Wiener, Joe Fitzgerald Rodriguez, another San Francisco native, born and raised, a uh, staff writer at the Bay Guardian, now writes as the examiner's political column on guard. He's also a transportation beat reporter who covers pedestrians, muni, BART, bikes, and anything with wheels. <laughs> and then finally on the end, we have Charles Rathbone, who's lived in the Bay Area since the late 60s. He's worked in the taxi industry since 1975 as a driver and as a labor organizer, and later as an assistant manager for Luxor Cab for nine years or so, I think he said, until he retired last year. His website, taxilibrary.org, covers the history, culture, and regulation of the industry worldwide. In 2011, he traveled to Rio de Janeiro as part of a United Nations expert group on sustainable urban transport. Charles represented taxis in the 2014 Late Night Transportation Working Group and currently serves on the board of the Medallion Holders Association. So thanks everyone for being here this evening. Thank you. So uh, let's just dive in. Before we start with the conversation, I kind of wanted to uh, kind of get an overview of the city's transportation matrix, the different ways we all get around. Uh, so we've got Muni, SFMTA, which is, I think, the eighth largest, possibly, in the, I'm not sure, I shouldn't say, but I know it's uh, not the fastest. The average fleet-wide speed is <laughs> eight miles per hour, I believe, is the fleet-wide speed, meaning um, you might be able to outwalk a bus for short periods of time. <laughs> um, and beyond that, it, it carries about, let's see, 70, I've got some stats, 702,000 people a day. Um, the Enjuta is the most populous line, carries about 40,000 riders a day. And when it was started in 1928, the Enjuta would take you from La Playa, the beach, to Ferry Building in 36 minutes. Today, it's 43 minutes. <laughs> uh, adding to the mix, there are about 45,000 ride-hailing vehicles, uh, Lyft, Sidecar, uh, not side, Lyft, Uber, Chariot, other, other uh, uh, few operations. Um, 1,200 mini vehicles, and 1,820 medallion vehicles. Uh, and this is more or less how people, and, and people walk, 
I think about five or six percent of San Franciscans regularly bicycle. Uh, Twenty-five percent of us take a cab once a month at least. Uh, so this is these are the ways we all get around. But show of hands this evening, how many of you took Muni to get here tonight? All right. How many of you took a private vehicle, a privately owned vehicle you own yourself that you pay for? Wow. wow. Nobody. Not a single one. Huh? <laughs> we know this crowd. How many of you? <laughs> right. How many of you used a ride hailing service like Lyft or Side or uh, Uber? Okay, interesting. Um, uh, Don't forget. Oh, the and, and yes, and how many walked? Of course. And how many took a cab? <laughs> and how many took a cab? <laughs> <laughs> and so a taxi, yes, anyone, medallion taxi. One person? Two people, okay. Okay, so that's a pretty good mix of a, it's a pretty good slice of life, I suppose, in San Francisco. Uh, and it kind of does lead us right into the first question, which is what's working well as far as our transportation matrix? What is the good part of using our transportation network and what is not working? And let's start with you, Evan, or your perspective as sure. a product person for, for a private company. Yeah, I mean, in terms of what's working well, I think, uh, you know, mobility is at least working well. I think we've, I think technology has allowed us to add a lot of new mobility options for people. Um, we're not, um, you know, like, it doesn't seem like traffic is better now than it was five years ago, uh, but it seems like there are at least a lot more ways for people to get places. Uh, so I think that's I think that's working well, and at least from the chariot perspective, you know we're offering people a fast way to to get work, to get to work, and to get home um, in a high capacity vehicle that's that's taking cars off the road. So, Senator, to you. Sure. Hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think in some ways what's working well is also what's not working well, which is our public transportation systems. Uh, so in addition to the 700,000 daily riders on Muni, it's about it's over 400,000 on BART, which grew much faster than anyone anticipated. And about, I think it's about 65,000 or so daily riders on Caltrain. And then, of course, you have AC Transit and other bus systems. Um, and in a way, uh, you know, and I, I've been a, a regular Muni rider for, uh, for 20 years before I took office uh, in the state senate. It was seven days a week. Now it's more like we were four days a week because you can't take it up there in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I think sometimes we're all critics of, of Muni, we're all critics of BART, uh, but it, compared to almost any other city, we have the amazing uh, public transportation bones. And the fact that you can get really anywhere on transit uh, is amazing in many ways. Um, and so we should be, I'm very grateful to live in a city that has so much public transportation infrastructure. Um, the challenge is that uh, we have come to rely on these systems so dramatically for our economy, for, for everything. We can't function without these systems. And we haven't kept them up. We haven't uh, modernized them. We haven't expanded them. And so we did this, these brilliant visionary things in the 70s by opening up the BART system and the Market Street subway. Uh, for example, uh, and then we proceeded to like not touch them for decades and to the point that BART uh, is really falling apart. It's getting shored up now, but we're playing catch up in a major way. Muni fell way behind. Caltrain is still in some ways operating like it's in the 1950s. And, and just to be clear, we have a lot of great efforts on the way to modernize and improve all of these systems, but we're, pe we're playing catch up. And we can see it in so many ways with the overcrowding on the Anjuda or on BART where you physically can't get onto a vehicle, the breakdowns that happen, and it's just not keeping up with the explosive population growth that we've had in San Francisco and the Bay Area over the last uh, multi-decades. Uh, so that's it's a good thing, but a challenging thing. And so the private transportation systems that have come in, Chariot, um, the employee shuttles, including the tech shuttles, uh, Uber, Lyft, really are a reflection of some of the um, deficiencies that we have in our uh, transit system that you can't always get where you want to go in an efficient way. And so other systems will come in to fill in uh, the gaps. 
Uh, and so that's a good thing that those gaps are being filled and people can get around. Uh, but it is a reflection on some of the challenges that we've had, particularly around our public transportation systems. You know, I think it's a, a, a way to frame this, and I think it's really useful when we talk about is transportation working, it's useful to frame for who and where. Because when we're talking about transportation, we're talking about commuters from one point in San Francisco to another point, usually from an outer lying neighborhood to the urban core, but not always. And we're also talking about commuters in the outer regions, which you then have to divide into East Bay, South Bay, and North Bay into San Francisco for work. So when we talk about is transportation working, you have to go, well, actually maybe working a little better within the city, city to city, within the city itself, less so than out of the city into San Francisco, and then for who? And then that measure, again, is better subdivided by uh, uh, working families. If I'm a single person, and I've, you know, I've been taking Muni my whole life. I was practically born on a Muni bus. And uh, I, I definitely learned to walk on a Muni bus. and got my Muni legs really early. But, uh, um, you know, uh, can you raise kids and use a Muni bus to take your kids to school and then go to work? Could you do that with the train? Uh, or if you're elderly and or you're a senior, can you take Muni? Um, if you use it for your commute and in certain neighborhoods, can you? And that's... I think that's the useful way to be cutting it. And the better Muni and the better public transit, better BART gets, the more you see them cut into those groups that have more burdens, more transportation burdens. And that's what you hear the most when you, when I'm at board meetings of the MTA and we've got one board member of the MTA here uh, tonight, well, Ramos is here in the back there, but, um, uh, not to call you out, man, but, <laughs> but, uh, um, but, uh, uh, you know, that's why I hear the most when I'm at those meetings is like, well, I've got to hang on to my car because I've got to drop two kids off here and there and I can't take the bus. So if you're prioritizing the bus over the car, then we can't make that work. And once you see public transit better for some of those groups, that's when you can say it's truly reaching a peak and being at its best. Well, I agree 100% with Joe that it uh, depends a lot on, on uh, who you're talking about. Uh, for instance, uh, people with disabilities that have a, a particularly uh, difficult time these days uh, getting around. I'm happy to say that the taxis uh, still provide a wheelchair accessible service. Um, we also uh, do uh, tens of thousands of uh, trips uh, every week that are uh, largely uneventful. I'm very happy to say that. I used to work the uh, complaint desk at Luxor Cab, so I'm, uh, I'm happy to uh, say that uh, not too many complaints these days. Um, one of the things that's not working so well uh, for us in the taxi industry is that we have a, a very hard time finding drivers these days. And uh, an, an indication of why that might be, I went uh, this morning to the uh, Lyft webpage, uh, to see what incentives they're offering to new drivers. Uh, $1,000 sign-up bonus and free use of a car, including insurance and maintenance. So this is, uh, this is pretty tough for us to compete with. Um, it also goes a, a way to explain uh, why Lyft is losing $50 million a month uh, and uh, they're, they're the other company, Uber, is losing a quarter of a billion dollars a month. It has to do with these tremendous subsidies that are, that are going into uh, supporting the drivers. So the good news is uh, from, from the taxi view, again, is we're still here. Uh, we intend to stay here. I believe that uh, within a couple of years, the uh, tr tremendous amount of funding that is flowing into the uh, ride share services uh, will start to dry up. Their investors are going to uh, require a return on their investment. Uh, at that time, I believe that there will be a resurgence of the taxis. Uh, our cost structure is uh, much lower than the uh, rideshare services, so I think that uh, we will still uh, still do quite well. The other thing that uh, I think is is working uh, well in in our industry is the transparency of our pricing. Uh, our pricing is uh, set by law. It doesn't go up and down uh, according to the weather. 
Uh, it certainly doesn't go up and down according to uh, transportation emergencies like the uh, BART shutdown earlier this week, which uh, resulted in uh, uh, tremendous uh, increases in the uh, the, uh, the fares that our uh, competitors charge. Obviously, uh, uh, many uh, of the uh, people in San Francisco really like the service of rideshare. Uh, there's no question that it's good service. It's uh, very prompt. It's much faster than a taxi cab. Uh, taxis uh, provide have, have about 17, 1800 cabs now. 45,000. If we had 45,000 cabs, we could be at your door before the, the phone is off the hook. <laughs> but unfortunately, we cannot. Um, I think that pretty much uh, says it does. Uh, it does. Yeah. Well, I, I want to go back to one of the things you mentioned. You're talking about paratransit, and and this is purely anecdotal. I don't have data backing this up. And in conversations I've had with disabled people in San Francisco who rely on paratransit services. What I've come to understand for some of them is that the weight that they have for, and look, look, look here, let me stop for a second. As far as I understand it, paratransit is, is basically a, a cooperation between taxi companies and the city. Is that more or less correct? The city pays taxi companies to provide services for paratransit. That is correct. Okay. So what I've heard is that anecdotally, because there are fewer drivers in the job, there are fewer paratransit drivers available as well. Fewer people uh, who are certified to drive, you know, wheelchair ramp vehicles, which means if you live in the Richmond and you want to get to your doctor appointment on, on Stockton, you'll wait longer for a ride than you used to because there are fewer drivers available. Is that something yes. you've heard as well? That is correct. And, uh, it's also a function of uh, fewer numbers of vehicles. A couple of years ago, there were uh, at least 100 uh, wheelchair accessible cabs in San Francisco. We're down to about, I believe, 42 now. The uh, cabs themselves are, are very expensive to buy. They're extremely expensive to maintain. They, they have a lot of a lot of moving parts on the lifts and so on, the, the ramps and uh, the tie downs and so on. It's also very challenging for the driver. The driver has a, a much more physically demanding job to uh, assist the people into the, to the uh, car. And it's, uh, how, how do I say this uh, delicately? That the customers tend to be um, the more difficult to uh, to satisfy, and uh, they're more more likely to. Uh, to have uh, uh, concerns about the service and so on. So it takes a special driver uh, with a special temperament and, uh, and a company that's uh, willing to absorb the, uh, the cost. They're, they're, they're not profitable for taxi companies to operate. So bringing Senator back in, when the ride hailing companies, when they launched, they weren't required or were they required to provide paratransit as far as picking up people who had, a, like I said, a guide dog, for example? Um, they weren't, and just to be clear, the taxis are regulated by the city. Uh, the ride shares um, are regulated by uh, the, the state. And um, I think the California Public Utilities Commission, which has about an enormous number of different responsibilities, was tasked with doing it, and frankly, for a while, was not doing it particularly well. I think the regulations have improved, but they're still... Uh, work, uh, work to do. But I, I think it's also important to be clear, and I, you know, I'm someone who I continue to this day, you know, my first choice is to, I try to take a cab. Um, but the reality is sometimes you can get a cab, sometimes you can't get a cab. And it, this is a, a balance. Let's talk about the, the BART closure whenever we have that kind of sort of system meltdown and people want to get uh, a ride somewhere. Um, it is absolutely true that, um, that the cabs will not do surge pricing. Um, but I can also, especially before, say, five years ago, when we really didn't have the ride sharing, it would have been almost impossible to actually get a cab. And that because so many people would have been competing for a very limited number of cabs. You would not have been able to get a cab. Now you can, you can get a ride share. And if you don't want to pay more, you can make that choice. You can say, I'm going to pay more. I'm going to wait for things. Uh, to calm down. And I think it's very important to just recognize that the ride shares didn't just happen. Um, you know, I, having lived in the city for 20 years um, and uh, someone who I like taking cabs, and there were so many years where you, you could not rely on getting a cab, not because the cab companies weren't working really hard. Of course they were, but there weren't enough cabs. And the cab companies wanted to get more cabs. Um, we were always working hard to try to get more cabs. But there were people who consistently fought that 
And so there were times when even you were downtown, you were in a saturated part of the city and you could not get a cab. Uh, and so having the ride shares in addition to the cabs together, you have so much more service. And I know people who gave up their cars because they now know that they're going to be able to get where they want to go when they want to get there. So it's changed everything. I want to see the cabs survive. I want to see the cab system survive um, to modernize and be able to compete uh, and survive. Uh, and, and I am cautiously optimistic that that will happen. If I may, it, 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 unfortunately, the one thing we're seeing in this change, though, is that people with disabilities are being left behind. I've done stories, and you can Google them later if you care to, uh, that show a significant drop, a significant drop in wheelchair taxi trips. But the demand hasn't gone away, the MTA has confirmed for me. The demand has not gone away. What's happening is there are less cabs to take them somewhere, and then Uber and Lyft, who, you know, you, you can... You know, have just simply not picked up that slack. There are no Uber and Lyft vehicles. In fact, no, I'm sorry, please, I'm going to correct myself. There is one Uber vehicle in San Francisco that is wheelchair van equipped. It's driven by a woman named Jennifer Mendoza, who has personally been trying to lobby Uber to actually have wheelchair equipped vans herself with her husband, Peter, who's kind of a bit of a prolific wheelchair advocate uh, for Golden Gate Transit and with Muni in the early 90s. And Uber is kind of expressing this kind of chicken and the egg problem. They don't feel like they see a demand for wheelchair service, but they're not getting demand, Jennifer says at least, and others, because they, people with wheelchairs don't think they can get them from Uber. And, and so and, and I think, one doesn't get the other. And I think that's a very valid point. I think it's government's responsibility to make sure that there is paratransit service through a combination of regulation and mandates, but also public subsidies. And I think that... The, I think as government, we have a responsibility to ensure through some mix of the two uh, that, that, that paratransit service is available. If the market isn't providing it, which it's not, not going to do in the way that we need it to do, that is up to government to make sure that it happens. And, and, and that, that is an absolute responsibility for the city and for the state. I want to bring Evan in. Is, yeah. is Chariot wheelchair accessible? Uh, not currently, but that's that's something that, that we definitely hope will change. And I'd also add, so I actually uh, worked on the wheelchair accessibility when I was at Lyft. And of course, I don't work there anymore. I'm not speaking in any official capacity there, but you know, tr that was you know that's a market that um, ride sharing very much wants to serve. And as we uh, as those apps added a way to try to to hail a vehicle, uh, if you are, can mark yourself as wheelchair accessible. We tried to find drivers, and there were just almost no drivers that would that would drive for this service, um, and there were no public subsidies available. So it's a it's definitely a chicken chicken and the egg problem of right. you know there was no demand to sustain drivers, and there were no drivers to come in and serve that demand. Um, here's a question: So our our TNCs, transportation network companies, which are the catch-all that the PUC uses to describe Lyft and Uber and the other companies are are TNCs uh, bound by the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Are they required to provide service for someone who asked for service? Uh, I do not know. Fair enough. That that's an open question. People yeah. have pushed. I mean, Uber was recently sued by a, uh, a man uh, who uh, some of us at this uh, panel know, Jonathan Lyons, who is a blind man uh, with a service dog who was uh, uh, passed up by a number of Ubers because he had a dog and they wouldn't provide him service. He sued them and won. I would imagine, I, I don't know for sure, but that had to have some bearing. And I, I, I would that would be an interesting case to look into to see if that had that, some bearing. That. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine they're subject to the law. I don't know if the law says that type of service has to has to provide uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles. But I'd also add that you know, in this discussion, I think... We also lose sight of the fact that there are people with disabilities that are not in a wheelchair that are actually much better served now than they were five years ago. There are people that have low visibility problems, uh, people that you know wanted to take a taxi but couldn't, didn't really have a way to know if the taxi was on the curb. Um, those kind of situations um, and the blind, the people that are much better served now, I think, with ride sharing being available and um, and services like Chariot than they were five years ago. So I think there's also a little bit of a nuanced piece of another 
part of the population that's much less discussed, um, that's, that I think is, is much better served today. Shift so, gears a little bit to the, sorry, did you want so to? If I, if I may, uh, uh, going beyond uh, the, the uh, disabled population, uh, again, Uber and Lyft are fantastically popular, and for good reason. They're very cheap, they're very fast, uh, the, the drivers are very uh, polite to a fault, perhaps. Uh, there's another side of this, though, and I, I think it, it's a, a broader a policy question, is that, that we have now a whole generation of younger people uh, who, who have basically abandoned public transit. And I think that there are long-term uh, consequences to that. Uh, you, you have uh, uh, needs for, for funding. Uh, these, these folks will be voters. They, uh, they are voters. And, uh, I think that the, uh, the, the, the turning away from public transit is, is a somewhat uh, uh, ominous, uh, ominous thing. On, on, on that point, Lyft just this week uh, uh, kind of pseudo and uh, very, very on the low key announced a new service. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, it's a Lyft Shuttle. And Lyft Shuttle allows you, kind of similar to Lyft Line, which is where people can kind of get in together on a carpool and split the cost of a Lyft. Um, you can go on a fixed route. So if I live, like I live on Balboa, uh, Anza, pardon me, Anza, and I want to go down to Geary, um, I can summon a Lyft. It'll cross, it'll go down Geary. I'll have to run down to Geary and grab it, and I'll carpool with people to downtown it's a fixed route but because you you say that you want to ride it they'll they'll know to stop for you on whatever your cross street is let's say fifth avenue say so it's kind of replicating muni lines and right now it go they have one that goes from the marina and uh, a line that goes from i believe the fillmore and circles around alamo square and to uh to downtown and back uh, for a commute i, I think it is uh very premature to predict the depth of public transportation as anyone you know we you take it as i know you do as i know most people in this room do um public transportation in san francisco is not suffering from lack of ridership it's suffering from lack of <laughs> investment and i like to talk about that but in terms of ridership muni ridership has only gone up BART hit 400,000 daily riders 10 years before they projected. Caltrain has almost doubled its ridership. Uh, when, when we were fighting about the tech shuttles in City Hall, when I was on the Board of Supervisors, uh, and people were like, just have them take Caltrain. Uh, and putting aside, you know, the issues in terms of getting to and from Caltrain, um, and putting that aside, we got, uh, if I recall correctly, I think we got a letter from Caltrain saying basically we can't fit them because those cars are so crowded. I have friends who live in Berkeley and work in downtown San Francisco, they no longer take BART. They take the AC Transit bus instead because they physically can't get on the BART. Um, I have, you know, in addition to all of my muni ridership, having just come off a long citywide campaign where I spent a lot of time uh, from uh, 7 to 9 a.m. at bus stops and, and LRV stops, uh, and the number of, of lines where people struggle just to get on, and including an enormous number of young people. Young people are riding transit. They also take Uber and Lyft and whatever, bike and whatever else, but they are taking transit. That is not our problem, ridership. The problem is that our transportation funding system is completely and utterly broken. The federal government funding has collapsed. The federal gas tax in real terms is worth about half of what it was 25 years ago. State funding has been anemic and at times has gone down. We have set up a structure in California making it incredibly hard for local governments to raise funds for public transportation by requiring a two-thirds vote of the people. I have a constitutional amendment I'm sponsoring to lower that to 55%. Um, and we, we need to get it together in this country with funding transportation. Our roads are in terrible shape. The freeways, it's not just transit. We have just abandoned transportation investment after doing these major things in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s, building the interstate highway system, uh, building public transportation systems. We have to get back to basics. And I will just close by just saying we are we have a bill that's going to come up in the state senate next wednesday uh to uh basically generate in all new revenue uh five billion dollars additional a year in state funding uh for public transportation almost almost a billion a year in new state funding for transit um three billion a year 
uh, for roads so local communities can help fix our roads and then other needs as well. It's not everything we, we need. We need a lot more, but it's a big step forward. And, and that's stunning because w many transit agencies uh, in the in the era of Trump were really fearing, um, especially because he was because he was signaling, especially with his budget, he was uh, uh, signaling massive cuts to uh, uh, starts funding, which is uh, you know very wonky, but essentially is the funding that helps fund new capital projects for uh, uh, transit agencies all across the country. I mean that touches. I mean, uh, uh, new starts funding. That that's uh, uh, the central subway. That's new BART cars. That's the new BART tube. That is a twinkle in someone's eye, some planner's eye to get a second tube across uh, the bay for BART. I mean that funding is so key to just about every transit project we have in the Bay Area and the country. And the fact that that new funding is coming is uh, making a lot of transit planners go. Yeah, you know, I, I do want to get into like a deeper conversation about funding, but talking about like the kind of competition factor for again, I know that BART was trying to do kind of late night service and extend their service and think until 4 a.m. possibly, and they had they were looking at dialing it back because they weren't seeing people turn out for the riders. People who wanted to come into San Francisco and you know enjoy have a good time would rather uh, take a car across the bridge, uh, as it turns out, and so. I want to lead to the question, do we basically have a multi-tiered transportation network uh, where you've got one level of service where I pay 225 for Muni or 250 and I get, you know, a one level of service on a bus and maybe I get a seat, maybe I don't, and maybe it smells, maybe it doesn't and so on and so forth <laughs> versus, you know, a lift line which might be twice as much for the same distance versus a private lift versus an Uber Black versus, it seems like there's diff different levels of transportation depending on what I'm willing to spend or put up with. I think there are options, and if you're, especially if you're with other people or doing a, a sh some sort of uh, share, um, the, it's not that much more expensive, uh, depending where you're going, to do a, a share than to uh, take public transportation at times. Sometimes it's significantly more expensive. In terms of overnight service, and, and Charles, thank you for serving on the, on the task force, we, um, I had authored the legislation to create uh, that late night uh, transportation task force because that is its own problem that you know Muni uh, and BART service in terms of the subways and the trains shuts down around 1 a.m. Um, and we don't have that overnight service uh, and, and, when, and even though we do have the overnight bus service there are times when people you have to wait just a very long period of time. And if someone has to wait 45 minutes an hour to get a bus, it's going to make a whole bunch of stops and they can just instead get into a cab or a Uber or a Lyft. Some are going to choose uh, that option. So I think for overnight in particular, um, having um, not just cabs, but also ride sharing has been transformational for late night transportation because we have not done the greatest job for public transportation overnight. Uh, and, uh, for people now, you know, when I first moved to San Francisco uh, in the 90s, people would, like, within San Francisco would drive to go out. That was really common. I can't even imagine that now. No one I know uh, drives to go out, and that's because you know you're going to be able to get a ride there. You know that at 2 a.m., stay out that late. I don't really do that much anymore. <laughs> um, you're not going to, you know, have that nightmare of not being able to get a ride. You're going to be able... Uh, to get a ride, and and that's also why I have a, another bill in the legislature to allow local communities the local control to decide whether or not to allow bars and clubs to go past 2 a.m. up to 4 a.m. pure local control. Um, and one of the really powerful things uh, is that uh, you know because of this, these expanded options, it makes that more feasible. I wish I had some whiskey so I could play the how many plugs for Scott's bills can we get into a, <laughs> <laughs> into a we're, we're in bills we're in bill season so <laughs> um, you know the multi tier question is interesting because it's um is it like I said in the beginning it really depends where you are um, a, a quick story uh, Muni is undergoing uh, which is run by the MTA is undergoing this uh, uh, new expansion that's undergoing for the past year and a half or so or maybe two years called Muni Forward. Um, it doesn't sound like much, and maybe you turn that down, it's a little echoey. Um, it doesn't sound like much, um, 
uh, when you look at each little bus improvement, oh, we're going to reroute this bus here and this bus there and a little more service here and there. But taken as a whole, Muni Forward is a transformational improvement in Muni, the likes we haven't seen since they built a subway under Market Street. Like it's really that much more service. It's an incredible leap and bound. But while making those changes, they had to make some hard choices because even though it's an increase in service, it's not an infinite resource. So around Lake Merced, there's the 18 bus. Anyone ever taken the 18 around Lake Merced? No? Yeah, a few people? Okay, we, we know it. All right, Scott's taking it. It's probably leafleting there. And <laughs> um, But uh, um, the 18 used to go around the south side of Lake Merced and pick up a number of people there. There's some thousands of people living on the south side of Lake Merced. Um, when Muni Forward was, uh, when the Muni Forward program managers were looking at the numbers, they saw, oh, there's actually been like a boon, uh, a boost of people who now live north of Lake Merced. Now they can't put a second bus there. They didn't have the resources for that. They had to decide to make the 18 go around the north side. And this had the effect of not having it go anywhere near these people who lived on the south side. Uh, <laughs> at all <laughs> for a good for a good part of the day like it all of a sudden they had a from a 20 minute commute from their south side of the lake to BART to an hour and a half commute or an hour commute depending this is a huge change this disenfranchised a lot of folks but it re it did enfranchise a lot more folks on the other side you have to make these hard choices but because they're in the south, uh, the, the far southwest of the city, they're by Lake Merced, there's not a lot of other transit options for them. The density of Uber and Lyft is not there in any large number. Uh, Uber and Lyft, if you have any Uber or Lyft driver show you their map, and I've had many, many, many Uber and Lyft drivers show me their little app on their phone, the areas of density where the Ubers and Lyfts are the most are the Marina, the Mission, Hayes Valley, the Castro, and downtown and south of Market. That's where you go when you want to get money, when you want to make money and you want to get as many trips as you can, you're still, even now, even as many people say this of cabs too, I've heard this critique of the taxi industry, so they're not innocent in this, you still don't see as much service on the southwest and southeast and the western side. So it's multi-tiered depending on where you are, depending on who you are. So if it is multi-tiered, and I think we there's some agreement that it is kind of multi-tiered, even whether that's good or bad, it just is. Um, if that's the case, how sustainable is that going forward if you've got, and this is a question for everyone, really, how sustainable is that going forward? You've got one level of service that's basically heavily subsidized by venture capital. Uh, what happens when the market changes, when interest rates change substantially? Um, you know, what happens when there's less transportation funding federally uh, and statewide? If Depending on the vagaries, what happens in the White House as far as you know, central subway and extending that, or bark to the beach, or a second tube. So, is it if we have a, if, if is a second is a multi-tiered system the goal? And if it is the goal, is it sustainable? Is the question I have for each of you? I certainly don't think it's the goal. I think the goal is to enhance mobility, and I think a lot of services have done that. Uh, I mean, there's so many more options you have these days. I mean, I remember. You know, when I was 22 and living in San Francisco and standing on the street corner for two hours at New Year's, you know, trying to hail a cab, that's not typically something you have to do anymore because now you have the option to pay, you know, more money for a ride home if you want to do that. Um, and it's, you know, from Chariot's perspective, I mean, we are, I think, a very different story from ride hailing companies. I mean, we are creating a self-sustaining transit system. I mean, we put 14 people in our vehicles. They are sitting very tightly you know, packed together uh, and covering the costs of the of transiting them. So, uh, you know, I think that's something that we want to broaden and happen in more places. But it's it's a self sustaining network uh, that we think is you know picking up for what public transportation hasn't been able to do uh, in some cases, and in other cases, it's taking people out of their cars. Um, and you know, I would there was an earlier point that you know I think uh, or that. Uh, millennials have given up on public transportation. I don't think that's true by any means. I mean, people want to take public transportation, but uh, to the center's point, investment has just not kept up. Uh, and I think that's why uh, services uh, like Lyft and Chariot have kind of sprouted up to, to fill that gap. Before, before I give yeah. the question to you, how can you, maybe you can't say the answer to the question, how much <laughs> of every dollar uh, for I, I pay for a chariot ride is subsidized by Ford. Uh, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I'd have to look at it and get back. But, of course, but I mean, uh, no, I mean, our, we were, 
when you look at Lyft and Uber, those are companies that raise billions and billions of dollars. Chariot raised, I think it was before I was even there, but I think $3 million. And, you know, we transport tens of thousands of people uh, every week. So there's, uh, you know, the, the costs, the riders are covering the costs uh, themselves. And that's, that's our goal is to have a system that's not, you know, fueled by outside money, but fueled by the riders themselves and giving people the ability to have another option other than driving. We find that, you know, our riders really want to take mass transit. Uh, they just find that a lot of them don't have that option. So. The, the taxis are, are quite different. Uh, we, we're the, the only uh, form of transit that I'm aware of, uh, you know, are the ones that we're talking about, that we are almost fully self-sustaining. Uh, we have some subsidies uh, for uh, paratransit, uh, but uh, almost uh, uh, almost every every dollar we get is, is from our own, our, we generate our, ourselves. We don't have any uh, good donors in the background. Are there any Venture capital folks in the room, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would Buy me a really drink. love to talk to them. <laughs> so, Senator, a question to you. Is is a multi-tier system that we have now, is that sustainable, and is it the goal, or do we want something different? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by multi-tier. Oh, well, I, I, I mean, as far as, like, the, the options are the options yeah. are great, but I, I guess more the question of, so, for example, in the question of late-night transportation, can you have that, if you have the, does the convenience outweigh the factor of, it would be good to take BART at a late hour, but the convenience factor kind of tips the balance for a lot of people. Well, well, I think it, it would be. And so, for example, um, if you try to take, I mean, and this is, and this is a battle I've been fighting with Muni for a long time, uh, where Muni, uh, and I, I don't want to be too critical because some of it is funding because we as a society have decided we're going to systematically <laughs> defund transportation. Uh, Muni has taken the view that once you're outside of the peak hours, let's say at eight o'clock on a Wednesday, or at four o'clock on a Saturday, or set, or you know nine o'clock on a Saturday or a Friday night, um, because the ridership is down, it's not at the explosive level that it is during uh, rush hour. Uh, therefore, we can just really scale back everything because we have less ridership. Well, the reality is. That even if, and the, and the most extreme is when you have spring, this makes me completely nuts. During like spring break or winter break, well, you know, people are on vacation with their kids or kids aren't going to school, so we have less ridership, so we're going to scale it back. And what about the people that, that need to take it? And, and, and if we really want people to rely on transit, they have to be able to rely on it at all times. That doesn't mean that you're going to have the same level of service at 8 o'clock at night that you're going to have at 8 o'clock on a weekday morning. Of course not. But to go to this other extreme where you have just sometimes, you, you know, a, a very, very long wait for an evening train. I'm not talking 3 in the morning. I'm talking about 8 or 9 at night. And that dissuades people from using public transportation. Uh, and it explains perfectly why people want these other services so that they don't have to rely just on that. Our job is to invest in these systems and to beef up that service and give people a viable option. As a personal aside, the only time in my life that I never had a month, regularly bought a monthly Muni Pass, whether it be the old school Fast Pass or the new school Clipper Card, uh, for those that remember the paper Fast Passes, um, was when I used to work in a, a, a cafe in the Presidio, and I had to get from the inner Richmond to the Presidio at like five in the morning. And there was no bus that's really running regularly enough. The 28, a little bit, the 43, not yet. And I just had to walk. I just had to walk. I just had to walk from the inner Richmond to the Presidio every day. I had killer thighs. It was great. But the, you know, I couldn't afford a cab every day. It was before the days of Uber and Lyft. Um, and, and just to say this, this, um, this question of who we serve and where and how in this multi-tiered service, you know, not to get too philosophical on you, but it really is a question to the soul of Muni, to who they serve. And it's a question they've been struggling with for a long while because they, transit planners and Muni planners, when you talk to them, will say, in order to speed up the bus, we have got to take away bus stops. We've got to take them away so that bus, the 38, zooms down Gary and gets downtown. And that's good for the riders who depend on it for the commute. But then other riders, seniors, people with disabilities, may not be able to walk to those to, to the stops that are three blocks away now, four blocks away now. It disenfranchises them to a bit, they will say. Um, 
And then Muni ends up needing to straddle the difference of both those riderships, of both the ones who want a speedy, quick, efficient service and the ones who want to walk. And it's a very difficult thing to straddle when the resources are not infinite. I don't think they've really been able to solve that. And then when we see these other services pop up, that leaves open the, the space for Chariot to pop up for those power users who want to commute quick. And that's when you get Chariot, that's when you get Lyft Shuttle. And if you look at Chariot's routes, if you look online at their routes, um, a lot of them um, mirror where express lines actually already do exist, but just not enough. The 30, I think, I believe in, correct me if I'm wrong, one of the earlier routes was the, the 30, the 30 X is route. We kind of mirrored the marina to financial district route, uh, for Chariot. And that already has an express route, but for years, people in the marina, and you may not have much pity for people in the marina, <laughs> And I grew up there. I know I don't um, <laughs> uh, uh, like to say, "Oh no, the 30 it never comes." By the time it hits me at at um, at uh, uh, Octavia, it's already full. I can't get on. Perfect opportunity for Chariot to move in, and that's why we're. That's one of the reasons we see the rise of these companies. Is Muni can't meet that particular market. A question for you, Charles. And I know I think was it this week or last week that Yellow Cab announced that. Yellow Cab San Francisco is basically for sale. Is that, do I have that correct? It is uh, more than for sale. It's bankrupt and it's in dissolution now. And it's, uh, it, it's not really a, a problem of, of, of competition with uh, the, uh, the ride share. It's uh, the result of uh, uh, collisions. Uh, they, they had some liability uh, issues or really bad collisions. Yeah. Well, they, they had a, a form of insurance. It was a self-insurance, so they assumed full liability for all these collisions that were occurring, unlike other taxi companies. So while there is pressure for Uber and Lyft that's affecting all the cab industry, they in particular suffered a number of multi-million dollar collisions that kind of did them in, including one for a woman named Ida Fua who, was, who uh, won an $8 million settlement for being paralyzed along the left side of her body after being hit by a yellow cab. And uh, she's like one of the sole... Uh, 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 people who is driving this, um, uh, when you look at the bankruptcy court documents, she's one of the creditors who's uh, making some of the most demands on Yellow Cab. You know, that, that uh, uh, brings to mind a, uh, an important difference between the, the ride shares and the taxis, and uh, we're actually uh, looking carefully at uh, what ride share does. If, when, when you uh, uh, sign up for Uber or Lyft and you, you click to accept, uh, you're actually giving away your uh, constitutional right to a, a trial by jury. Uh, you are forced into arbitration in the event of, a, of an injury. Not so with taxis. Uh, if you get hurt in one of our cabs, uh, you can take us to court. And uh, Ida did, in fact, do that. And so we are don't really like it too much, but we're starting to move a little bit in that direction. The, the, the taxi apps now all have... Uh, similar clauses in them, and uh, the day may come when, uh, you know, before you can get a taxi ride, you have to sign away your rights. I, I, I hope that doesn't <clears throat> that day doesn't arrive, but it's it's a real concern, and uh, it's it's not theoretical. You you see what, what happened to Yellow Cab. Or the day may come when government says you can't force everyone into arbitration. That might be another result. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. With, with actually, this leads to another good question. I think. Uh, you say so myself. Um, is this industry of transportation network companies ride hailing, is this now a mature industry? Uh, what, what do you think of this year? Mature industry. Uh, I guess it depends what you're, how we define a mature industry. I mean, it's. Uh, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask a different way. Are these companies still startups? Got it. Uh, I mean, I would think. At, at this point, no. I mean, they're you know they have global presences. They do. You know, millions and millions of rides, uh, and I think they've, you know, there's a clear, they, you know, they have a fit in in the marketplace, and a lot of people want to use them. Um, so I, you know, I think in Chariot's case, we're not a mature company. I think we're in, you know, we're in two cities, San Francisco and Austin, Texas, uh, and we're still very much trying to figure out how to, you know, make Chariot work everywhere. Uh, that's a harder challenge, I think, than getting people to hop in a Honda Civic. Uh, getting people to hop in a 14-seater van is, is you know, a tougher sell in Austin, Texas than it is in San Francisco. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to figure out how to make that work. And I think we are very much um, still a startup. As for the ride-hailing companies, I think that's probably, you know, less true. Although unless, you know, if your definition of a startup is they're still private, then I guess that's true. 
Senator? Um, I think operationally uh, they strike me as mature, um, but in terms of I mean, business model and regulation, et cetera, not. Um, it, it is amazing though. You can, you know, yes, it's it's you're, it's going to be much faster to get an Uber in or a Lyft in you know, downtown or in the Castro of the Mission, but uh, you, you can get one in any part of this. Maybe you have to wait six or seven minutes or or or, or ten minutes instead of two or three or four minutes, uh, but you're going to get one, and you can get one in the suburbs. People get them in the suburbs. Uh, my uh, my parents live in a suburban part of New Jersey, and uh, and they when they have one car and my mom is working, my my dad can call an Uber in suburbia, um, and uh, and so I think in that sense that it's pretty mature operation. But I don't I don't think that this that these companies are going to be the same in three or four years as they are now. I think there's still a lot of transition going just in terms of financial uh, stability in addition to the regulation. But are, are we still, I guess, culturally and in terms of regulation, are they still being treated, I guess, like startups? I think they're cut a lot of mm -hmm. slack um, because... <laughs> uh, Misbehaving and, teenagers? And I think, no, and I, and I don't say that that's, that's a, I think cutting someone slack is a, it can be a good thing, it can be a bad thing, it can be a neutral thing. I say it in a neutral way uh, because I think for, all, you know, I think sometimes when new things come along, there's a tendency and our instinct is to say we have to treat it like something that already exists and apply the same rules to it and just force it into that box. And and if you do that too fast, you can put an end to something that is really good. Uh, and so I think we've been cautious in, in not wanting to act too quickly. Um, on the other hand, you, you do have to... Uh, you know, acknowledge what's there and then regulate it appropriately. And it's really striking that balance. And so you cut some slack, but not too much slack. Quick question. Actually, hold that thought, Charles. Question for you. About in 2000 or so, what was, uh, if you wanted to buy a medallion in San Francisco, what was the cost around ballpark? 2000, I, you could not buy it for a lever money. They were not transferable. They, they became transferable and Somebody help me out. Was it 2010? 2010. 2010 uh, first time in uh, at least a generation that the medallions became transferable. You know, the, the uh, transferability of medallions is, a, is an interesting subject because uh, it presents an opportunity for uh, to generate a great deal of money. Uh, I think it's, I'm not exaggerating to say that uh, were it not for uh, the, the current uh, uh, competition with the, the rideshare, the uh, medallion program could easily generate a billion dollars in, in revenue for the city. Uh, that money uh, is sorely needed now, uh, especially as we go into a, a time where the city is looking at uh, shortfalls of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, uh, thanks to our, our friends in uh, Washington. But uh, that, that program has, uh, has stalled now to to uh, use the, the gentle word. Uh, so what happened? What happened to the, uh, the perceived value, I guess, of a, mm -hmm. as an asset, uh, as a piece of, as you know, a, a chunk of wealth, a medallion? What was it relatively worth, I suppose, 15 years ago compared to today, relatively speaking? I don't know what it would be, have, have been worth 15 years ago. The the price that is set by uh, regulation <laughs> in San Francisco is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The drivers perceive that as a store of value. A way to accumulate uh, money for their retirement. Uh, it, it makes a lot of sense to uh, a driver uh, to uh, to stop renting uh, my cab and have his own cab, and that makes uh, makes a lot of sense to many drivers. In fact, I believe approximately 700 uh, actually uh, purchased, and they are uh, rather rather distressed right now. So, but so from your perspective, and I'll bring this back to the rest of the panel. From your perspective. What's easier, uh, starting your own cab company or starting your own transportation network company, which has more barriers? I think it's easier to start a, a cab company. And as as to the question of uh, whether uh, whether the uh, uh, TNCs are mature, they'll be mature uh, companies once they make a profit. I think that will happen within a few years, but the 
the companies will change uh, their, their their business model in the process. Is, is my prediction become more like premium taxi services? Jeff. Yeah, you know, you're talking a little bit about Uber right, and Lyft in terms of regulations. Uh, the CPUC has what they call their, their phase one, two, and three proceedings. And uh, right now they're in phase three. Phase one started around when um, the TNCs, Uber and Lyft, were first beginning to be regulated and other TNCs, you know, at, who existed at the time, uh, Wings and a whole bunch of other sidecar, a whole bunch of defunct TNCs that have fallen by the wayside over the years. Um, but each of those phases considered very particular things. In this last phase, we saw decided right as they were coming to a decision about it, uh, state legislature kind of swoop in and decide for them that uh, Uber and Lyft could use rented vehicles, uh, rented or leased vehicles to, to uh, kind of ride share, which I think is fascinating, right? Because the whole proposition when it first started was, I have a vehicle. I drive to work. Uh, on my way to work, maybe I'll give someone a ride. Ride share. And then they'll give me some bucks. Um, but now you can go out and rent a car or lease a car and use that as your main mode of, of making money. And that's they still kind of use this ride share moniker, which I find interesting. It's funny, actually. So here's a good note. So the, AP, the Associated Press, they have a style guide for how <laughs> reporters are supposed to refer to businesses, people, places, whatever it is. And so the AP style guide last year changed ride sharing to ride hailing. Which we uh, since, use in the examiner and and, uh, and a hoodline as well. Who on me for not <laughs> saying it up well, here? But <laughs> I wasn't here to think of wag. But yes, you wanted to chime in or? Uh, well, it's, uh, there's also a hyphen there. Let's not yes. forget about that. The yes. AP is going to get you. Um, but no, I mean, I think I think that um, you know these services are providing a big need that the taxis were not filling, and I'd also point out that they're providing much more innovative solutions as well. I mean, I don't think we'd want everyone in this room to have taken a taxi here. That would have been a lot of taxis on the road and everybody probably would have been in their own taxi. Uh, these services allow you to share a ride with somebody else. Uh, they allow you, uh, to, to Joe's example, they these days actually do ha both have products that allow you to offer rides to people on your way. Uh, I live personally, as an anecdote, I live in Menlo Park and once a week, I need a car because I need to go play hockey after work. And I turn on my Uber and Lyft app, and I put in my destination, and I give people a ride up to San Francisco. Uh, and it was actually a, this week, uh, the, one, the one time I did it on Tuesday morning, Caltrain had broken down. Mm -hmm. So, you know, four years ago, five years ago, when I was taking Caltrain, and I had to sit on the train for two, three, four hours after a breakdown, now there are options, and I got to swoop in and pick somebody up and take them all. It turned out he worked a block away from me. And that's that's something that would have never happened five years ago, uh, and that you know we haven't seen taxis been able to facilitate. Um, so I think that's been that's been an upside that there are these other solutions, and they are trying things like Lyft Shuttle. And you know I think Chariot has uh, kind of shown the the greatest ability to to try to solve the traffic problem uh, and take a lot of you know put a lot of people in one car. To to the idea of uh, maturation of regulations and uh, you know. Uh, a lot of folks in San Francisco now are pointing to congestion. I think Scott may disagree with this, but some folks uh, 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 out there in San Francisco, officials, uh, some in SFMTA, and I think uh, Supervisor Peskin have questioned, you know, how much Uber and Lyft contribute to traffic congestion downtown, especially when we have 45,000 active vehicles, which was kind of a scoop that our paper had when we first uh, asked for data from the treasurer's office to see how many business licenses they had uh, requested. Um, and uh, to see if that number of vehicles is actually impacting downtown. Because when you think about it, and they have a heat map of places that they will congregate in the most, if you've got tens of thousands of vehicles and they're in one or two or three neighborhoods, how much does that affect traffic? Um, but Uber and Lyft don't share that data because they consider it proprietary. Um, Uber is afraid that Lyft will get their data and scoop them on something, and Lyft is afraid Uber will get their data and scoop them on something, which actually does happen a lot. There was a, uh, I believe when Lyft was first announcing Lyft Line, and I could be wrong on this, you need to double check and help me on this, but when Lyft was first announcing Lyft Line, as the story goes, Uber, pool, Uber got wind of it and then launched their own Uber Pool service, which had no information behind it and was just kind of a name, and a, we're gonna carpool, because <laughs> they heard about Lyft uh, announcing line. So it is very cutthroat, but the result of that is is that the state 
gets that trip data, the CPUC gets the trip data, the data that could tell traffic planners and transit planners whether or not it's adding to congestion, how they can reshape the streets to better make Uber and Lyft more convenient for people. And they kind of keep it behind lock and key. It's all redacted. If you request it, it's all blacked out, blacked out, blacked out. The city has asked for this data. MTA has lobbied, uh, uh, lobby may not be the exact word, but has asked for this data uh, many times and uh, has made requests of uh, the CPUC. I think 26 separate times have filed legal claims uh, during a uh, phase two proceeding of uh, uh, regulation to get this type of information and other information and has been largely denied. I want to turn to the future of transportation as the title promised. Um, Charles, I, I, without your best guess, in, in 20 years, what do you think uh, will be the biggest change in the city's taxi industry? Good question. Um, one thing that uh, I hope changes is that as it is now, uh, uh, taxi that the, the taxi driving occupation is overwhelmingly male. Uh, that's a big problem for us. Uh, it it uh, basically uh, is because of cash. Uh, cash uh, attracts robbers. Uh, the, the industry has a, uh, a history of uh, being uh, targets of criminals. Uh, one of the, the questions that I would... Uh, love to pose to the uh, people in the room is uh, what would you uh, what would you think if uh, the taxis stopped accepting cash altogether uh, as a way to get access to that other half of the workforce that, uh, that might come to drive taxis uh, and perhaps improve service uh, improve uh, safety for drivers uh, would you be comfortable with a taxi industry that no longer accepted cash. Yes. Uh, I'm yeah. seeing your heads going, no, no, no. <laughs> yes, that is correct. You, you would need to pay with a credit card or, or a, a stored value card or a clipper card uh, at the beginning of the trip so that uh, there would be no cash in the vehicle and uh, no, no, no targeting, no, no reason to target a driver uh, for a robbery. But I think that's one of the things that, um, if I had my way, uh, we would be moving in that direction. And I know that's a very controversial uh, point of view. But well, actually, so what's what's stopping them? Given that we live in a, we, right now, I wouldn't say this is a cashless city, right? But I can get along pretty well most days in San Francisco and never have to go to the ATM to actually draw cash out for anything. Most places have point of sale, something or other, square, whatever it might be. What's stopping that from happening today? Making the cash, uh, making taking a cab a kind of a cashless, frictionless transaction. What's the blocker? The the biggest uh, obstacle is the uh, that it's a very conservative industry. Uh, we've, we've been in business. Uh, the, the industry has has operated since at least the 1600s, and uh, remarkably little has changed. <laughs> <laughs> The, the vehicles have changed, but uh, the, the, the basic business structures are very similar. So a follow-up question then. Do you think, given the lack of innovation in the transportation industry, um, how, much, how much do you blame, who's to blame, I suppose, for the state of the taxi industry in your mind? Who's, res well, who's primarily responsible for the state of the taxi industry. Well, I mean, uh, certainly we, we, we share some blame for our, our own fate, uh, but uh, uh, one thing that's that's not uh, well known is that uh, per perhaps uh, folks remember that in uh, 2008, uh, Luxor Cab introduced a, uh, an e-hail app called Taxi Magic. Uh, it was worked very well. Unfortunately, we had no idea just how important that was. It seemed to us a kind of a Kind of a niche uh, market, you know, people people are using their phones, so their, their their smartphones to to order a cab. But that was uh, 2008. Later that year, uh, Green Cab introduced the Cabulous app, which is now called Flywheel. It was two full years later before Uber introduced its app, which was functionally identical to uh, Flywheel uh, and Cabulous uh, to, to the Taxi Magic. So I, I don't think that it's it's fair to say that uh, we don't innovate. Uh, we we do innovate, and uh, 
So that's that's something that that, that, that we are actually kind of proud of. And, uh, I just wish that we had realized the importance of what we had, and we did not. Joe, to you, in, in 20 years, how do you think you'll be getting to work most days? <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to punt a little bit and, um, and, and refer to a, a really fascinating uh, a pitch I saw from SFMTA a while back that I wrote about a while back called uh, uh, the Smart Cities. It was a grant that uh, the city was going for and didn't get. But within that kind of pitch that MTA had for what the future of San Francisco would look like, there were uh, uh, self-driving cars with lanes specifically for self-driving cars. There were shuttles that were kind of short-term kind of uh, 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 ferry building to the wharf uh, across Market Street, little mini shuttles that were also self-driving and would take you to little shops and things. Uh, and even the buses were which did exist in SFMTA's idealized version of itself in the in 20 or 30 years, did, existed as self-driving buses, able to uh, maneuver in and out of lanes at will with bikes and buffered bike lanes and, and more room for pedestrians everywhere. It was a, it's a fascinating proposal. I, I, I suggest you all Google it if you get a chance and you're interested in seeing what the future SF Transit is. It's called the Smart Cities Proposal, so S San Francisco, uh, SFMTA's smart city proposal uh, and you can look, see in a piece I wrote on it if you Google as an examiner with that uh, and they had a whole uh, uh, I, I believe what did the fellow say who was pitching it he said it's a total moonshot <laughs> it, it really was is that it? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think it's going to be a mix of things I think there are some people who will say oh why are we investing in rail we don't need that. It's going to be the hyperloop and autonomous vehicles, and that's going to be everything. Uh, and I do think that uh, autonomous vehicles are going to play a huge role in a lot less than uh, than 20 years. And you know, let's and for another <coughs> panel about the uh, millions and millions of Americans who work in driving in some form or another, and what we're going to do when we have autonomous trucks and autonomous buses and autonomous uh, everything. Um, it's going to it's it's going to create a real challenge. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be a mix of um, some version of public transportation uh, and autonomous vehicles um, and uh, and biking. We haven't talked about biking a lot. Let's not forget about it. That's been in existence for many centuries and will continue to be. Um, I do think one thing I will say is I think the Bay Area will have, um, and this is contingent on uh, – Getting rid of Donald Trump, if I may be political, um, <laughs> getting a better federal government and keeping the state, the momentum we're building in the state. I think we'll have a much better and more integrated regional rail network. Um, we'll, you know, BART, which we're going to fix. Uh, we're going to um, connect Caltrain and ultimately high speed rail. And I do believe high speed rail will happen. Um, to the Transbay Terminal. We're going to get it, the train downtown, and then we're going to get it across the second Transbay Tube that will not only allow BART to run 24 hours, but will allow us to connect Caltrain uh, to the Capitol Corridor and, and ultimately get high-speed rail uh, to the East Bay and up north. Um, uh, you shouldn't have to take three transit systems to get from San Francisco uh, to Sacramento. I'm a little, being a little selfish when I say that, but it's true for a lot of people will go back and forth to it too, and it's not acceptable. So I, I think we're going to see a much more integrated regional rail system and a lot of autonomous vehicles. Cool. Uh, well, I mean, I think thinking into the future, you know, 20 years as I glide into the Trans Bay on my brand new high-speed rail train, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm super excited. I first of all hope that we our public space is really different 20 years from now than it is today. An unbelievable amount of space in this city and all over the country, all over the world, is devoted to parking. You know, you look at every single block. I mean, this block included. Uh, I walk down. I walk down uh, Post and Sutter all the time. And even though almost nobody is driving to Market and Post, almost all of the curb space is devoted to parking. And I hope that you know, with ride hailing, with chariot services, with autonomous, uh, you know, we can redevote that space to public good. We can make you know dedicated bikeways. We can make places that these autonomous vehicles or taxis or anybody that can pull over safely. 
Uh, that's a, that's a you know a big issue for chariots is just we have you know often the the spots are taken by private cars that have been parked in a passenger loading zone, um, and you know I, I w we want to see that space rededicated to the to the public, uh, and I you know I hope that we'll be living in a world where rides are are safe and they're affordable. Um, you know that's one of chariots' big missions, um, but I you know I really hope we the, the public devotes so much money to just getting around these days. And I really hope that the cost of that, uh, you know, drops significantly. Uh, but I'm also worried that, you know, with autonomous vehicles and with high speed rail, you know, if you can get from downtown Fresno to Transbay in an hour, I may just move to downtown Fresno. Uh, you know, that's, that's probably not what we want to do with our cities. Uh, so I think we need to think very carefully as we enter this space about how we can make sure that we still encourage density and we make it easy for people to walk, you know, and uh, we have the infrastructure for high capacity vehicles so that if, you know, Lyft and Uber are rolling out autonomous vehicles, we're all not just hopping in those and quadrupling the number of vehicles in San Francisco. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I think it'll be a better place, but we have to put in the work now uh, to make sure that happens. Great. Before we throw out the questions, I have last one last question for the panel, each member. It's kind of a yes or no question. Uh, if it were available and the technology was proven, would you want a flying car? <laughs> <laughs> it's the hallmark of future technology, everyone always says, so I, I had to ask. Uh, I can start that off. I can say definitively no. Uh, I mean, my I, I live in a, a one-car household right now, uh, and I would love to get that to zero if we can you know, bring the cost of transportation down. Uh, I, sorry, I, my wife uses the car, so it's not just me having one car. Um, so, you know, I've, and if everybody has a flying car, where are we going to put these things? Uh, and, it's and where, and <laughs> I worry quite a bit about the drivers. Uh, and, you know, we have enough of a problem keeping people driving safely on the streets. If they're above the streets, I'd, I'd be a little worried. Like air rage? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd worry about air. I don't yeah. know if it's car rage, air rage. Yeah. Maybe. I loved the Jetsons when I was a kid, so yeah. <laughs> I, haven't ha I haven't had a driver's license since 2011, so I would probably say no. And then the, for the second reason, I just rode in a stunt jet that was not quite the Blue Angels fast, but just about that fast. Yeah, above Mount Diablo. It was pretty cool. But uh, after about 20 minutes, I did have to use the, uh, I did have to use the sickness bag, so no. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, uh, no, no, no flying uh, cars for me. I, 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 being, I worry about collisions. Being in a, a, a collision in a car is bad enough. Uh, I don't want to have a big fall as part of, part of the collision. <laughs> Thank you all very much for this discussion. I really feel it was a really good talk. So We're now open for questions. We'll start in the front and work our way back. Please limit your no comments. Limit it to questions. I think uh, Senator Lena said that there are 400,000 people using the Muni every day. That's a little correct. I spoke to someone who works for the MTA, and I want to know: Is it solvent? He says they're losing money. Why does the MTA lose money? If they have 400,000 people using the Muni. It, well, it's, it's 700,000. Um, uh, so fares for Muni, uh, they call it fare box recovery, the percentage of the system's uh, costs that are paid for by fares is about, it's like 25 or 28 percent. Uh, so as with most public transportation, it is uh, heavily subsidized. It's a public good. It should be uh, subsidized. Uh, and so about three quarters of Muni's costs are not recovered in the fare box. BART has a much higher fare box recovery because unlike Muni, uh, BART is, uh, it's a regional orphan system that is not backed by any general fund. Uh, and that is actually, when you look at the problems that BART has, that, that shows you why when you have the really high fare box recovery, that's not necessarily a good thing. That means that you don't have a government actually backing you up and the system, you have your fares and they have their little quarter cent sales tax and that's about it. And so they start falling apart. Uh, and so it's about public subsidies. So I'm not allowed to say, I would ask, but these are questions. Yeah. <laughs>
I would like to ask you what role state and uh, local government plays in protecting the public. Now, Charles spoke about the fact that if you're in an accident in a cab, you know, you have a right to pursue that legally. And of course, you have the same right if you're in an Uber or a Lyft. But Uber and Lyft have already proven you're kind of on your own if anything happens with them. And also, in terms of the um, insurance and the maintenance of the cars, the background checks of the drivers, which are questionable, I simply don't believe that they do the background checks that the cab companies do. They're not fingerprinting. They're not doing any of those things. So why has this been allowed to go on as long as it's been going on? You know, the, all the relative unfairness to the cab industry and all these other things as far as the environment issues, which no one wants to talk about, is something else. But I'm very, very concerned with public safety, and I'm not hearing that. You know, um, insurance is required. There are now for ride uh, hailing, at least the AP term, um, and it is uh, available now. Initially, there was really, it was hard to even find a product, and insurance should be required. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think the regulation is better than it was. It still has a way to go, um, but it has been improving. One thing I do want to just say, um, you know, as someone who I've been riding cabs and uh, Ubers and Lyft now for many, many years, there are unbelievably great cab drivers, and there are cab drivers that are not so great. Um, there are, wait, let me just finish. There are unbelievably good Uber and Lyft drivers and ones that are not so great. There are cab drivers, who, you know, a large majority, who drive very safely, and there are ones that don't. There are Uber, Lyft cab drivers who, who treat people with respect and those that don't. I've, uh, you know, so there are, there are good and safe and respectful people in all of these industries and ones that are not so much. So I just don't want to broad brush. But with that said, I agree. We, we have been improving the regulations, the safety regulations in particular, and there's more work to do. When Uber and Lyft first started... Oh. Oh. Um, All right. Um, there are 45,000 Uber and Lyft drivers. What do you say about limiting the Uber and Lyft drivers to only San Francisco residents? And um, what do you think about the idea of having Uber and Lyft drivers or some kind of um, jitney service be sort of the last mile service from buses and trains and that it should be limited to that? You know, Lyft for a long time painted itself as kind of a last mile solution. And, you know, they really did try, they have in many cities had partnerships with different public transit agencies in order to do that, to actually be there and have it be systematic. We are here for when you get off your BART, we're going to take you that last mile to home. And that's kind of what we're there for. Um, I remember going to a few tech conferences. Uh, Emily Castor, who's a, 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 you know, maybe your former boss at Lyft. <laughs> Good friend. <laughs> Good friend. Maybe. Well, I'm sorry. Drop my... Audio thing. You're unplugged. I'm unplugged. Okay. Okay. Let's go acoustic. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna go acoustic again. Sorry, audio guy. I apologize. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, spoke a lot about that last mile solution. But it's interesting to see Lyft make that shift now with the Lyft shuttle, because now it's perhaps showing that. And I'm, I'm just speculating, but if that that last mile solution hasn't turned into as many rides as it could have, because now they're they're uh, replicating some muting service, which just interesting, fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd add to that. I mean, there, there are 40, I think it was, was it just Lyft? I don't know if that was Lyft and Uber. Um, but we have uh, a little less than 150 chariots on the road in San Francisco. Uh, so we are, you know, if you focus on high capacity vehicles, uh, chariots really able to do, to get a lot more people places than a ride, a ride sharing, a ride hailing service. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd add to you know your question uh, about limiting it to San Francisco. I think that you know a lot of the problems with taxis have actually resulted from cities setting boundaries on things. And I think that's why 
the state has regulated this industry because if you allow cities to set up borders, mm -hmm. that creates a lot of problems. If I live at the border and just want to go across, well, that's, you know, if, can I not get a ride from my neighbor who lives in Hillsborough or South San Francisco because he's right across the way? And, you know, I wouldn't, I live in Menlo Park. Would I not be able to drive my neighbor up to San Francisco and operate in San Francisco or drive, you know, my neighbor back home to Menlo Park? Uh, oh. I, mean, I think there'd be a lot of, there'd be a lot of negative implications to that. So, Although what's fascinating is seeing how far people will drive to come in San Francisco to drive for Uber yep. and Lyft. People during the Super Bowl uh, came up from Los Angeles to drive. I've, I've actually I've had drivers on Lyft from Fresno. For so, routine routine it's, stunning. I, it's stunning. It's well, stunning. Quick, quick question for Charles, actually. What's the certification process for becoming a tax driver in San Francisco? Background <laughs> check? There's a fingerprint-based background check. is a uh, training program, uh, geography, rules, um, Customer service. There's also a drug test. Um, am I missing something? I think that's it. So it's it's a higher bar than becoming a, a TNC driver. Yes, it cases. is, and okay. that's, uh, that's 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 good for the public. It's a little little bit difficult for us because it takes longer. Uh, if you want to sign up to, for a Uber or Lyft driver, it's like that. It's very, very quick. Uh, for us, well, it's not quite like that because you do have to pass a background check, and that can take time. Right, but there's a difference in the background checks. There's a third-party background check done by TNCs, which usually use kind of like uh, independent businesses who, who scroll through public records, but maybe not to the same depth of records that the Department of Justice has. And then the Department of Justice database is utilized by the taxi cabs, which use uh, thumbprints versus the TNCs, uh, the ride hails, which use uh, names and social security numbers. A district attorney recently uh, sued Uber and Lyft uh, saying that they were fal using false advertising for saying that they were, you know, the safest option because of this uh, kind of uh, discrepancy in the background checks and was, you know, showed, you know, people who had uh, uh, been accused, of, uh, had, had uh, been convicted of certain degree, uh, I think like second degree murder, people who were rapists, people who were all sorts of different high degrees of crimes who were, uh, who made it through the TNC background check system. Uh, and that, you know, what Uber and Lyft would argue is, well, hey, shouldn't uh, people who were formerly convicted of crimes be given a second chance? Why are you clamping down on people who, you know, are just pay their debt to society? Why can't they work again? Which, you know, you get to take the argument either way. Yeah, there's also the state does limit how far back you can look. So that's right. yeah, that, they that, use that the Department of Justice database that goes back 100 Correct. years and goes through all the United States. Yes, please. I spent time in Amsterdam and I love the bicycle friendly city. I'd like to figure out how to make San Francisco more that way. It's just too damn dangerous. I would need to work every day on a bike. Um, and then they spent time in London and the zone pricing I thought was a very interesting idea. So it's very expensive to bring Congestion a car. pricing, you mean? Pardon? Congestion pricing? Congestion yeah. pricing. So it's very expensive to bring a car into London during rush hour. And as a result, it's much safer to bicycle in London than it was even 10 years ago. So I'd love to see some thinking in terms of how do we do incentives and so forth. To get more of us on bicycles, you know, I need to lose 20 pounds if I were biking to work. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, and, be, and because in London, because there are fewer cars in the downtown zone, the taking a bus in London is, can be faster than taking the tube. They're, they're very, very fast. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add on to that. You know, we have a problem where, you know, if you want to take a chariot, you may be sitting behind a lift that's sitting behind a single occupancy vehicle. Uh, and there's no, in, in most of the city, there's... We don't have any infrastructure to encourage high capacity transportation methods, and that includes bicycling. Uh, I mean, I take, I use bike share all the time and am re regularly feeling like I'm risking my life doing so. Uh, I think it's, it's still, I've, I find bicycling to be one of the best ways to travel regardless of that, but most people don't feel like that. And, you know, my, my parents probably don't feel like that. Uh, my sister probably doesn't feel like that. And I think we really need to do a lot more to make a, a city bike friendly. And get people out of their cars. It's mer it's a very important part of the puzzle. Question here. Thank you, and uh, thanks to all the panels and the Mechanics Institute for having us. Uh, this is a wonderful um, panel. Um, given the fact that Muni, uh, the the more crowded, the more traffic that that comes from these um, TNCs that are flooding the city, the slower traffic goes, the slower buses go, the more expensive they get, the harder it is to provide service. Um, and uh, particularly to serve people with disabilities is my primary concern um, that I don't think that we figured out yet. And I, as, as my parents, I was so excited to take my mother onto the Anjuda the other day and the thing pulled up and she couldn't 
lift her leg up to get onto it. We ended up having to rent a wheelchair for her later. And um, my concern is, is that to the gentleman from, from Chariot, you said, we hope it will happen. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can tell us what deliberate, intentional efforts you're making to make sure that this happens, because these guys are, you know, the writing's on the wall almost from, and I appreciate Mr. Rathbone. We're so lucky to have him in the, in the taxi industry. Um, I wish they would have gotten with Taxi Cab and Taxi Magic and all these apps. But what are you doing to, to help us um, address this problem up, apart from hope? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think we're trying to figure out how, um, it's a little hard for me to comment because it's not quite my, my department, uh, but, you know, we're trying to figure out, I think we, much like Lyft and Uber did, if when they first started, fall into a different space. We're not quite a bus, we're not quite Lyft and Uber, and we're trying to figure out how we can serve that population. Uh, we really want to, uh, and I don't think there's, there's a great solution uh, for, I think, Riding paratransit is, uh, you know, off, it can be slower, and uh, I think we want to try to figure out how we can accommodate uh, that population and our regular riders. And I think we're, it's, it is something we're working on. So I, I need to clarify one thing, or else uh, uh, the head of taxi services at MTA will take off my head next time I talk to her. And that is that uh, uh, the paratransit services that we're talking about that are not being served are the at will kind of randomly, you know, I want to go here today at, you know, on a whim kind of services, taxis, ride hails, those are the ones that wheelchair accessible people can't get. There are fixed services that you can ask for like a week in advance that are very robust and that the city provides. Yeah. <laughs> as far as the ride hailing services go, I think there's a little bit of an elephant in the room, something that Charles alluded to. If Lyft is losing $50 billion a month and Uber, $250 million a month. I read an article that said a ride with Uber is only 40% covered by the cost of the fare. What's the landscape going to look like in a few years when a $10 Uber ride costs $25 or $30 or $35? I think the answer is that uh, they will be uh, essentially premium uh, taxi services. Service will be uh, very similar to what it is now, but it will be uh, quite a bit more expensive. It, it has to be more expensive. And when you, when you think about uh, the cost, when you have a vehicle, it doesn't matter if it's a taxi or a ride share, vehicle cost is there. Uh, the fuel is not going to, there's no real difference. There's no real difference in the, the cost of labor, whether you're paying the person a commission or a wage or whatever. The, the, the ride share driver, the taxi driver, all of those uh, costs are, are there. And, and what's different is that, for instance, uh, DeSoto Flywheel Cab, uh, their facility is located uh, in the Bayview District underneath a freeway next to a railroad track that's adjacent to a giant uh, recycling center. It's some of the cheapest real estate in San Francisco. If you look at uh, our, our friends at Uber, they have two office buildings under construction in Mission Bay. They just announced that they're going to uh, lease two more uh, buildings at the uh, the warrior site that's fantastically expensive uh, their their costs are vastly more it's a difference between a local small local company and a giant uh, global uh, organization their costs are much higher than ours so when uh, their investors finally demand a return on the investment some of them have been waiting eight years now uh, they're Costs will have to be higher than a taxi, and they're not going to go away. Uh, people love them, and for good reasons. Uh, but uh, the, the cheap ride is going to go away, I believe. And I, my my guess is two or three years uh, that that uh, transition will occur, and that's why I'm staying in the game for now. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's like without speaking for the tech for the TNC industry, I think at least what I've read or researched. It seems as though Uber, at least, is kind of existentially banking on uh, advances in technology to make self-driving vehicles much more of a reality. Um, and I think that's that. That's what. Again, I, I can't. I'm not an Uber employee, but I think as a market watcher, just when he observes, they're banking on that bar by becoming like much lower immediately. And to be honest, I frankly thought it would be about. I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 years before those were viable. Um, and so I was kind of. I'm sure like a lot of us were kind of shocked to see that Tesla actually has self-driving cars on the road today. 
Um, and I think that probably is kind of part of their plan. I mean, you guys could probably speak to that more than I could. But. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's that's likely the long game. Uh, but you know, I also I think those articles also mentioned, and Charles mentioned it, that a lot of that money goes to pay for these driver incentives. Um, so I think you know, at least look at the rides that I give from from Menlo Park to San Francisco or San Francisco to Oakland. I mean, those companies are they're taking like 30% of of the ride, and not you know, I imagine they're uh, some of that goes to insurance, but uh, you know, on a per ride basis, it may be profitable. They just may pay a lot to get people like me to actually sign up in the first place. Um, so as the businesses mature and more of those people stick around, uh, potentially they become profitable. Or, and I selfishly hope they don't do this from, from my business perspective, but or they put more people in the vehicles. Uh, and you know, we figured out a way to have a transportation service that covers its costs and it's a very affordable transportation service. I mean, Chariot, the average ride's around $4. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, up there with, or probably cheaper than a latte. Um, so I think there are ways to make these new services affordable. Um, and I think that's, that's a great thing. Question here. On the Muni, when we're in a tunnel, say, in Judah, we lose uh, connections. We can't uh, listen to, we can't make a call, we can't listen to YouTube. And if there is dysfunction, we can't call into the office. We'll be late. Big money is not indispensable. <coughs> we need translator technology because the wire is into tunnels or around UCSF. That, it's already been fixed. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. I want to show, I congratulate MTA for. The Muni Hybrid Electric is it's one stair almost parallel to the street. Well, but let's quickly about BART. It it's it contrasts deeply to the magnificent engineering of Bechdel. When we're on BART, when they announce the stations, it's hardly hearable. And my question is <laughs> my question is. Why can't there be a better accommodation for our passengers to know the name of the station or if the signs were more clearly? Thank you. Very uh, the, the new BART trains uh, address some of this. They have uh, the BART's fleet of the future, which is which is coming. Uh, <laughs> they they swear. Uh, uh, we'll have you know more prominent displays, LCD computer displays, color coding. It's gonna look. It's gonna look much more New York like in terms of like having better branding of what station you're at. And the new bar cars, uh, they say, will not make you go deaf as you're um, uh -huh. heading along uh -huh. certain parts of the system. In addition, um, in terms of the um, Muni uh, and the lack of uh, reception in this in the tunnel, honestly, that's a uh, uh, MTA does many things well and is doing many things better uh they're going to fix that that was a just a major failure uh by the agency that for so many years they just really just didn't care it wasn't a priority to do that and so you're stuck in a tunnel and you can't even text your you know co-workers that you're going to be late fortunately better late than never they're fixing that uh that was due to some uh, legislation by supervisor uh, london breed i believe oh one funny thing about the tunnels the future is actually here when you're in a muni train in the tunnels that's that's computer controlled it's only driver controlled when it's outside of the tunnels which i think is interesting miss all the discussion about the future of self-driving vehicles. Well, it's easier on a fixed skyway yeah absolutely <laughs> we have a question here and i'm just going to ask you just make your question short and fast we'll get to everybody uh, Tom Fremsky, Silicon Valley Watcher. Why don't we talk about telecommuting at all? Uh, all these big corporate buses. Why, why doesn't the city say, hey, you're losing, using our lanes, our bays. Let your workers work from home at least one day a week. That would take, that would help a lot, wouldn't it? Could, could, could we demand or ask for that kind of uh, thing from the companies? Yeah, I, I was, I can take that real quickly. Uh, but there's actually more people in California telecommuting now than taking public transit every day. Uh, so public transit, there there's a lower percent of people taking it now than there were 35 years ago, whereas telecommuting, I think, is just shy of 6% and was, uh, you know, for maybe obvious reasons, near zero 35 years ago. Uh, but I think that's a, it's a great solution, and it's actually been 
if you look at the numbers, a, a more effective way to take cars off the road than transit has been, unfortunately. And I think there's a lot that we could be doing, uh, you know, that the government could be doing to incentivize that. There's enormous telecommuting happening already. Yeah. It's enormous. Living in San Francisco with a family, especially children under nine years old, is very challenging for a lot of reasons, but transit is one of them. Taking a kid across town at the peak hours of meeting is very difficult and challenging. Uh, but I could, if I was on by myself, get a subsidized chariot ride. I could get a subsidized bus pass because uh, it's not as uncomfortable to be with a small child. What does the future hold for families in San Francisco as they're on the decline and there's a lot of challenges for us to remain here? I mean, actually, the the, the number of kids in San Francisco is actually going up. Like the school district, for example, school enrollment in San Francisco has been going up. Uh, the challenge has been that um, the we're seeing, uh, I think, disproportionately more than in the past, it's higher income families that are, can afford to raise um, uh, kids in the city. It's just very, very expensive. And so the, the challenge is for everyone, uh, but particularly for more middle class and lower income uh, families about how you raise kids uh, in the city. And, you know, I think if we, if we do it right with transit and these other options, uh, you know, there, there are families who need to drive. And, and, and if, if you are someone who needs to drive for whatever reason, and there are many, um, it's in your interest more than anyone to have great transit. Transit is not for everyone all the time. That's why we have to have numerous different options because different people have different needs and the same person might have different needs at different points in the day depending on where they're going or how they're getting there or whether they have a little person with them and whether their four-year-old with them or not have their four-year-old with them. Uh, and, and so that's why having those numerous options and not squashing, you know, efforts to create new modes of transportation is so important. On that topic, there are uh, there is a riot, uh, there is a new proposal, uh, kind of, or, or a, a kind of a, a study going on right now to look at reviving uh, shuttles, uh, uh, school buses, but in for for the private sector in San Francisco, uh, I believe it's Supervisor Katie Tang. Who's, who's, uh, and the SFCTA, the County Transportation Authority, who are looking into ways to subsidize a shuttle service or otherwise spur the creation of a quasi-public-private uh, partnership to create shuttles for kids again. And who knows, if we had school buses once again, maybe the parents can set their kids off on a school bus and take a bus themselves to work. Okay, I'd like to thank the panel. I had a quick question for the panel about uh, potential interest level. I'm actually doing um, like research right now on the, the population of what type of vehicles are out on the road right now. I've actually conducted maybe like five hours of like observation from like various elevated points in the city. I find out like, I mean, one in three cars in this neighborhood is actually like a TNC, one out of three, holding steady after looking through like 500 frames. So I was wondering like, what would your interest level be in like maybe like seeing that some of that data too and potentially... Um, you know, even for Senator uh, Weiner, you're potentially, um, you know, requiring, you know, on a state level that um, counties be allowed, you know, access to that data the CPC is denying in order to uh, calculate wear and tear on roads and infrastructure. Well, so, in, okay, so let's talk about downtown San Francisco. If that, if that is the case, that one in three vehicles in downtown San Francisco is a TNC, uh, I, that may or may not that could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing. I mean, if we're talking about that fewer people are driving their own cars into downtown San Francisco because they're taking TNCs again, there are actually benefits to that because those TNCs aren't taking up parking spaces. We don't have to have as much parking downtown if fewer people are driving their car. So I think having, in terms of the proportion of vehicles, that doesn't necessarily tell you a lot other than that a higher proportion of people are not driving their own cars there. It's really about the number of vehicles overall and how is congestion in downtown San Francisco now compared to what it used to be. I think it's always been really bad. Um, we have more people in the city than we ever have. We have 200,000 more people in San Francisco than we had 30 years ago. We have many more jobs in San Francisco than we used to have. We have more people 
coming here and commuting here. So there are a lot of reasons why there's more congestion in the city. But frankly, if we don't, if we have fewer people or a smaller percentage of people driving their own cars downtown, looking for parking and then having to have space for that car to park, that, that can be a really good thing. You know, one thing that's not mentioned when the fewer cars are on the road argument is made for Uber and Lyft, which is a very strong argument and, and absolutely cars being taken off the road as congestion increases is an aim that many public agencies and governments have, um, is this idea of latent demand. And a lot of folks really don't mention that when they mention, oh, this method or that method, whether it's Uber, Lyft or biking or whatever, takes cars off the road. But latent demand is kind of the idea that your service is so good, it's so uh, cheap, that you're actually spurring demand that didn't exist. If a certain amount of people used to uh, drive to work, a certain amount of people used to bus to work, a certain amount of people telecommuted, but Ubers and Lyfts are so cheap now that it actually spurs people maybe who used to telecommute to say, oh, actually, I can go to work today because it's so cheap and convenient. They never used to transport before, but now they're hopping in an Uber or Lyft, or they yet never used to or they used to take the bus and now they're hopping in Uber and Lyft. You're creating demand for a service that didn't exist before because it's so cheap and convenient. And some studies of traffic of created by Uber and Lyft have cited the idea of latent demand, which is fast. And we may see soon how, how large a factor that is. There's a study coming out soon from UC Berkeley from uh, their transportation department uh, from Susan Shaheen, who's largely regarded as one of the uh, leaders in ride hail expertise and car sharing. And she's she's looking into this and has unique data from Uber and Lyft that no one has ever been given access to before. So it's really it's really fascinating. Oh, the latent demand can also mean that your system was not adequate before. Correct. And it's better oh, absolutely. now. So, absolutely. Yeah. But Another, it can mean the other thing too. It can mean it can, it can mean a few different things. A slightly different perspective on that is that at forty five thousand vehicles, the uh, TNCs are. Uh, by far the largest uh, single uh, commercial users of our uh, streets. Uh, and because of the regulation at the state level, there's no collection of any kind of fees or taxes on the local level. Uh, myself, I pay approximately, I think it's around $1,300 a year in fees to the city for my, my uh, taxi licenses. Uh, which I don't think is uh, particularly unreasonable. It's, it's fine with me, but I, a little bit irked that the uh, the other guys are paying nothing. And at forty-five thousand, I, I did a little arithmetic today, and because uh, I, uh, I read the article uh, a couple of days ago about the, the shortfall on the uh, the late night bus service that uh, uh, AC Transit runs on behalf of the park. Uh, that's facing a uh, five hundred thousand dollar uh, I believe this, the statement from the BART person was that they need another $500,000 to keep it running for a year. If you collected $1 a month uh, from 45,000 TNCs, uh, that would more than cover that. I don't think that's a, uh, there should be a contribution uh, to the uh, to the broader uh, transit system uh, from the uh, from the TNCs. And, and if the taxis make that, uh, they should be able to, that the kind of contribution they should be able to do that too. Hi, there was a, a statement on the panel earlier that it takes a special type of taxi driver with a special attitude to serve disabled passengers. That's not true. All taxi drivers should be prepared to serve disabled passengers as they would a black passenger or a trans passenger. Uh, given that and given the opaque answer that Chariot gave to an earlier question, what are concrete examples of what the taxi industry is doing and that Chariot is doing to work with the disability community to improve access? Well, as far as, uh, as what the uh, uh, taxi industry is doing, I, I can really only speak for the company that I've worked for, for uh, until I retired last year, Luxor Cap. Uh, Luxor's general manager and its assistant manager both serve on the uh, PCC, the Paratransit Coordinating Council. Uh, have done so for years. Uh, it's a uh, an, it's a, a genuine effort to uh, reach out and to understand and to be be a part of, of that community. Uh, that actually stems from uh, a, a family issue with the Luxor Cab. One of our uh, former general managers became a wheelchair user herself and was unable to use her own cabs. So 
uh, there, there's, there's, there's a sensitivity uh, to the needs of uh, people who use wheelchairs that uh, runs pretty deep in our, in our company. I hope that uh, is responsive. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can add too much more. Uh, and it is something we're working on. It's just not. It's another team that's working on it. Um, so hopefully, we'll have you know more details to share. Yeah, uh, I talk to a lot of taxi drivers, and I haven't begun to hear about their plight, which is huge. Okay, they're working six, seven days a week. Some of them for free because they're not even making the gates. Their daily rental. They're driving from far away, Sacramento, San Jose. Uh, they feel they're being screwed by MTA, being screwed by the city in part because the mayor's relative has an investment in Uber. Um, they feel that Uber drivers who can't drive, don't know the city, are turned downtown to a parking lot. What immediate help can anybody give them? Uh, <laughs> there, there is a, uh, you know, it's interesting, there is a taxi fund that uh, taxi uh, 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 company has been paying into recently. Uh, not recently, for for many years, and then that fund uh, it, it was put up to a vote by certain, I think, taxi taxi drivers. Maybe I correct me if I'm wrong. Task force. It's a task force. Thank you. And that that amount of money is going to come into some relief for the local taxi industry. So that that might help them a bit. It's, it's, there's there's no big thing on the horizon, but that pot of money at least is going to help some people in the short term. I'm not going to answer that question because I think we spent a huge amount of time talking about taxis and very little talking about transit or bikes. So I would love to answer questions on transit or bikes. I'm going to ask you about climate change. <laughs> uh, I've been seeing a lot of, uh, new, especially with Uber and Lyft, uh, new vehicles. They don't even have license plates yet. And everyone has made comments about people driving in from miles and miles away. Has there been any research done to see what the effects that's having on the, the atmosphere in the city and our quality of air. I just feel like there's more cars on the road and that's kind of defeating the purpose of ride hailing, you know? Um, yeah, so we, do you we have, have any a, research on that? Well, there's a new law that requires temporary license plates when you drive off a dealer's lot. That was a hole in California law where people could drive off without having any kind of identifying and so that, um, and then go through the Bay Bridge for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so that, that, that problem is, is in the process of being, uh, fixed and it took way too many years to get that law passed. Um, you know, I, I think to me, the, if the goal is to get people around, uh, and to do it in an environmentally sustainable way, uh, it's not about saying there are too many Ubers or Lyfts or buses or anything else on the road. It's about saying, um, how are we going to have vehicles that are as environmentally friendly as possible? Uh, we know that California has always been in the lead in terms of fuel efficiency, um, moving towards electric vehicles, et cetera. Um, we have federal government is now trying to take our legs out on that, and we're going to have a war with Donald Trump over whether we can continue to drive the auto industry to more and more fuel efficiency, and the auto industry should be ashamed of itself for even having that conversation with Donald Trump. I'm really just furious that they're even involved. And so to me, the goal is electrification. It's electrification of our tra public transportation systems, electrification of vehicles, and just really driving that through public policy and through incentives to get vehicles, whether they're an Uber, or Lyft, private vehicle, a bus, a train, anything else, um, away from fossil fuels, electrified, uh, and, and, and then making sure that we have a revenue system as gas tax starts to decline uh, so that we can still pay for our roads and our transit system. That, that's just my take on it. And if, and if you want to be environmentally friendly, you, you, you don't need to look farther than Muni for someone who's really kind of leading in that way. And, and uh, you know, the, you see the, the buses with the, with the poles, the bunny ears, you know, on the wires. Uh, it's actually really hard for MTA to purchase those. Um, uh, it's, we're one of the few cities, if not one of only two cities, uh, in the entire country that really heavily depends on those buses. It's easier to purchase buses when you purchase them in bulk. So we've partnered in terms of purchasing other types of buses, hybrid, elect, uh, hybrid uh, fuel buses, um, with uh, King County uh, in Seattle in order to kind of double, you know, uh, San Francisco's purchasing power 
so they can get kind of a, a deal on buses. But we use we are one of the most bus dependent and and trolley bus dependent uh, transit systems in the country, and it's it's fascinating um, what hoops they have to go through in order to get those environmentally friendly buses. Two last questions here and there, and we're wrapped. I have a question about bikes. Uh, mm -hmm. So the uh, it was perfect that you said that. So the question of passenger loading. Uh, in bike lanes, when there are streets with bike lanes, especially when there are streets with bike lanes and parking, uh, is, is seems really difficult, especially when um, the parking interests are are, are pretty uh, pretty loud and they come to meetings. Uh, but even without parking, there's still a, a, a difficult challenge of how to deal with safe, efficient passenger loading without putting bikes at risk uh, from their safety and their efficiency as well. So how do you how do you recommend we we deal with uh, passenger loading and bike lanes. Uh, you know, I mean, there are two things. First of all, uh, it's the wild west in terms of double parking in San Francisco. Um, there's really almost no enforcement. And I, when I was the board of supervisors, sort of pounded on SFPD and MTA uh, to increase their enforcement. And they really never did so. There was a lot of lip service, but SFPD in particular just. I just think isn't interested in doing robust, consistent double parking enforcement. And it's not just, it blocks bike lanes, but it also causes traffic jams. It uh, blocks Muni. It's a, it's a big problem. And uh, our city government just has not, the, the administrative agencies have just not shown the will to really do double parking enforcement. Uh, so uh, we, we can design streets in a way where you can have both loading and unloading uh, and safe cycling and uh, and lack of double parking to block traffic. Uh, we we can do that with loading zones. Um, there's always going to be some conflict, uh, but but you know I, I, the number of times where I have seen we all have everyone in here a delivery truck double park mm -hmm. blocking a lane of traffic even though there's an available loading zone they just don't want to pull over because it's less convenient. It, it happens all the time. So without the enforcement, we'll never see change. Um, hi, so I have a question about sustainability, but I'm wondering about sustainability beyond the carbon footprint of individual vehicles and more like community sustainability. Um, anecdotally, it seems to me that almost all of the TNC drivers that I've encountered are under 40. They're digital natives, and they people who probably have something beyond the high school diploma. Um, and I'm wondering about the shift of labor from like full-time jobs for taxi drivers in a city that's having a hard time maintaining blue collar middle class jobs to a side gig for people who will probably go home for like three months. That's, I'm just wondering if anybody has any thoughts on, on that issue. Um, well, we'll share an observation that the uh, taxi workers are uh, disproportionately uh, uh, new Americans and uh, often with large families and uh, uh, I'm very happy that uh, we we're, were able to provide a, a, an entree into the economy. And uh, what else can I say? Uh, the the TNC industry does has shown that it can work really well for people who only need it for part-time gigs. And there's it's replete with stories of folks who are teachers and uh, have other jobs and need side money and. Like, like this fellow here or deciding to drive someone up on their, on their way to hockey or whatever the heck they're doing. Um, but that's, and, and those, and for those people, and that may even account for the large numbers we're seeing. 45,000 registered drivers. I don't know how many of those are full time. We don't, we don't have data on that or how many of those are part time. It may be that a good many of them are part time and driving only two hours a week to make a few extra bucks so that they can take a vacation to Hawaii or whatever, but, um, or to, pay the rent. Uh, but for the folks who are driving full time, it's more and more we're seeing that that's not a full value proposition for them. The amount of maintenance for the car, uh, the, uh, the amount it takes for gas and other amenities, um, all of that, you know, we, there are reports that are hard to verify, but there are reports out there of high burn through rates for Uber and Lyft that they lose drivers in a very, very quick basis because they drive for a while, then they do the math, and they go, oh, actually, well, <laughs> maybe this is not so great. Hard to verify. But you hear a lot about it. You see a lot of reports about it. You hear it a lot from the drivers that after a year or so, they realize it doesn't pencil out. And so for those full-time drivers, 
who are awaiting the rise of the self-driving cars to put them completely out of work, um, it may not be a value proposition. But there is something to be said for those people who are making the temporary money or making the, the side gig money, uh, and people may poo-poo that, but there are a fair amount of people who, who do make a uh, uh, make that little extra bit um, using Uber and Lyft. And I would just add, I mean, it's, I think Chariot took a very different tack than Uber and Lyft, and we hire only W-2 employees, and those that work full-time get health care, they get training, and we're, you know, we're able to, you know, if they need to be retrained on something like double parking, we can do that with our staff, and that's not something that ride-hailing companies are able to do. Uh, and then I'd also just add that I think, you know, a lot of it may actually tie back to housing. It's really, really expensive to live in this city. And people, I th not just in the city, but in the state, and people are desperate to find other ways to pay those bills. Um, and so I think a lot of this relates back to that. Uh, and I think we'll need to work hard to try to make living here more affordable so that people don't need to rely on those on those services to make money. But I also think they've they've changed the mix of who's picking you up as well. Uh, you, you know, you might have a lot more college educated people because maybe you have people giving rides on their way. I always, when I, when I give a ride to someone in a lift, I'm always very confused because the first thing they usually say is, are you busy? And I'm giving one ride, you know, to work. So I don't really know how to answer that question. Yes. Uh, so I think it's also really changed the dynamic of who's the person giving you a ride. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks for attending. I really feel like we had a great conversation tonight. Thanks for our panel. Okay. I'd like to thank you for an engaging conversation. Continue your questions and engage with us in future programs. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Appreciate, it. Appreciate it. Hi. How are you?